But a lot of the deflationists point to the 1930s as an, as an example uh, that actually prices went down and it was deflation and so on. Um, but uh, I've always viewed this as being rather different from today because you had the remnants of the gold standard in that it was a gold exchange standard right. and so and there was a lot less debt around. Um, so you had, um, I suppose what Keynes would say, the, the vanishing of the animal spirits yeah. <laughs> in yeah. spades. Um, but uh, without the debt around, um, prices were actually able to go down. But that's very different now, isn't it? Because there's such a divorce from the values of paper currency mm. and the values of real money in the form of gold or silver that the situation is rather different. Is that how you would see There's it? a lot more leverage out there today yes. than there yes. was then. Um, the, 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 the problem you have right now is that uh, while in the 30s you did have a, a deflationary uh, monetary implosion from the collapse of the money multiplier because of the bank runs, yep. and the bank runs weren't just in America, they were worldwide. And the reason for those banks failing at that time, of course, I've argued is this Mulally tariff that just sabotaged the whole world trading yeah. system, which then brought down the banking system, which then tells us the fundamental problem is central banking in America yes. as well as uh, in Europe. And central banks were not able to, to stabilize that, that money multiplier, yeah. given that kind of hard, real shock on the trade sector. And so what I think is different today, I, I do think is different. I mean, here you have Ben Bernanke at the, at the Federal Reserve, who's a student of the Great Depression. I cite yes. some of his work. And the reality is, is that uh, the central banking structure uh, has given us a point where if you have another contagion, another collapse, uh, it could be horrendous. And we, we know that. My only point is why are we in a central banking structure? Yes. Why do we put ourselves vulnerable to these hard exogenous shocks? And part of our shocks can be legislatively induced, it can be monetarily induced. And either way, it still shows up in the same thing. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pessimistic, extraordinarily mm -hmm. pessimistic over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. I see real, uh, real rigidities. Um, we have it in our, I mean, Chairman Bernanke even made this point. Uh, there's only so much monetary policy can do. He's got his foot on the accelerator at warp speed at this point. The unemployment rate is not coming down. No. But we also have 99 weeks of unemployment compensation. Yes. And we have the president wanting to extend it another year. Yeah. Now we know that the more you replace the wage and the replacement rate, the longer the duration of unemployment. Yeah. And now we're having durations of unemployment mm. vastly longer than in the Great Depression on the labor market. They can monetize all they want all day long. That wage is not coming down to a full employment level. Yes. And so I always like to say there is some rigidities in that system, but it's not for the reasons Keynes would say. <laughs> I would argue that what you have is government that is super glue in the price system. And the governments Absolutely. have manufactured massive doses of super glue and they're squirting it in every possible labor markets and, and other yes. markets, uh, subsidi subsidies uh, and, uh, and other types of protection. And you sit there and you say, well, then the price system doesn't have to accommodate. It's just being yeah. subsidized into uh, stationary positions when it really needs to move. Yes, well, I'm very interested in what you're saying there because um, there's so many rigidities in the European um, economies. And mm -hmm. it is, I mean, the, the whole of, the raison d'etre, it seems, for the European Union is to introduce more and more regulations, right. not only over, over um, uh, employment, but over every product that's produced. I mean, we've, we, we, we've laughed over the years about how they're regulating for straight bananas and goodness uh -huh. knows what. Mm -hmm. But this has got to the point where there is a fundamental interference with the benefits of the capital sy capitalist system uh, in Europe. Is, is it as bad as that in America or just going that way? We're, we're, we're heading this way. That's why I watch <laughs> Europe, because where Europe is, we are in five yes. years or ten years. You know, when, when, when they started uh, the European uh, Union and so forth, and there was this great hope of lowering tariffs and freeing commerce and so forth, until politics, which yep. naturally gets involved in this. We don't have economists running the show. We don't have philosopher kings running the show. Mm. And, and it turns out that interest groups find the seeds of power 
and they come up with creative, ingenious backdoor ways uh, uh, to uh, get protectionism and mercantilism yeah. under the guise of uh, food safety, under the yes. guise of French culture and movies, under the guise of there's always something. Yes. And you say, you know, the old mercantilists used to just be more honest. Uh, they were just getting Indeed. special favors. The new ones have all kinds of creative mm. uh, uh, facades out there, shall yeah. we say. And so I, yeah, I expect it. I mean, the the uh, the eurozone is going to get more and more fortress Europe, yes. and then within it, you're going to see more of those yeah. rigidities. In America, we see it right now. We see it right now. Mm. We have uh, a president that does not understand economics. We have states that are verged on the edge of bankruptcy. Yes. Uh, we have uh, a downgrade in our own debt. Uh, we have deficits almost 10 percent of the GDP, and those are likely to get bigger. And uh, and they're proposing more of the same. Yes, and it's more interesting. Bailouts, more the, regulation. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, I, it's it, it's horrifying, yeah. really. Um, and it is at this time that the old communist bloc um, have, seems to have grasped some parts of capitalism. Sorry. But the one thing they don't have mm -hmm. is this burden of unnecessary regulation. Right. And it makes it a lot easier, I think, for businesses, uh, both in Europe and uh, in America, to re relocate their manufacturing to those areas it, where some of the um, uh, some of the means of production, you know, whether it's particularly labour, yeah. and the time taken to build a factory and get it up and running is a lot shorter. Yeah. Um, it's just so much easier to do business. Is this something that you think is yeah, exactly. a major part of the problem? Exactly. In America. Um, the cost to comply with federal regulations in the United States, in fact, I gave this lecture yesterday in one of my classes, <laughs> $1.8 trillion. Really? $1.8 trillion mm -hmm. compliance cost with federal regulations. Now, this does not include state regulations, city yeah. regulations, county regulations, all of the 50 states with their own yes. uh, mandates and rules and so forth. So you look at $1.8 trillion, that's a hidden tax. Yes, as, of course. As Richard Posner taught us back in the early 70s, mm. regulations is a substitute for taxation. And it's, it's a subtle, indirect, hidden tax, but it has the exact same distributional effects. Yes. It's the same burdens, the same depressants on economic activity. So you look at this, and, and when, when you actually break these numbers down, for a small business of 20 or less employees, it's over $10,500 per employee per year to comply with federal regulations. Really? $10,500 per employee yeah, yeah. for every employee uh, in a firm under 20 employees every year to comply mm. with federal regulations. So you look at this and you say, well, this is going to have absolutely disastrous effects on the labor market. Yes. And, and, and that was based on 2009 data. Yeah. So this doesn't include all the regulations they're writing at this point yes. for financial regulations, health care regulations, and all this. That's yeah. still to come down the pike. So there's enormous uncertainty of how much this bill is going to be. In the end, in the end, we know businessmen don't pay the tax. They collect yeah. it. And it's going to end up in lower wages because of the higher unemployment, and we're seeing that. And it's going to end up in higher consumer prices. The capital will leave. Yes. The capital will not earn a below a competitive rate. It will leave, but the workers will stay unemployed. And then they yeah. will draw 99 weeks of unemployment mm -hmm. compensation of which then adds to our deficits and we yes. continue down this road. So, so I look at this and, and I just, you know, I, I tell people, 1.8 trillion in compliance mm -hmm. costs, that is $6,000 for every man, woman, and child yeah. in yes. the country. It's $24,000 tax per family of four. My that goodness. is huge, that, that is, is huge. absolutely huge. And of course, I, you know, having um, been a, a businessman before, uh, you know as much as anyone that employing someone is actually quite a decision oh, without yeah. all this. That's right. Um, the idea that businessmen hire and fire, I don't think it's true at all. Um, really, when they hire someone, they want to hire someone because they want to increase their business. That's right. Uh, and they need people to help them do it. Uh, and it's a very personal relationship, really, between um, the employer and the employee. And if you introduce all these extra taxes, all the extra like, regulations, minimum wages, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, That's right. you're making that relationship a lot more difficult, I guess. That's exactly right. What is happening with federal regulations is to the extent wages do not fall and unemployment does not rise, 
the compensatory mix that the government is ordering. So if the government says we want more safety in the workplace, yeah. well, what's going to happen is wages will fall, monetary wages, to offset this in-kind benefit that is being mandated. Yes. And while it may look like the same compensation in dollar value for the same amount of productivity is the same, but it's not true mm. because the compensatory mix that workers have bargained for has shifted Absolutely. from their preferences to what some bureaucrat is ordering them to, to have. Mm. And so in the best case scenario, workers are better, uh, worse off because they get their compensatory mix shifted from what they're working for. In the worst case scenario, you have all these transitional costs of uh, people being out of work, factories moving abroad, yeah. uh, and, and all of this uh, uh, inefficiency structures yes. throughout the system. The problem is, is that many workers, like you're talking about these mm -hmm. conflicts, uh, have no idea what the entrepreneur has to deal with in employing them. Yes. They think the gross salary is what they're paid, and that's all yeah. it costs the employer. Yeah. And in America, it's a 60-40 split. 60% yeah. of all compensation on the labor market is in monetary cash wages that are taxable. The other 40% of all compensation in the United States mm -hmm. is in in-kind benefits, insurance, right. other types yeah. of benefits which are tax-free. Yes. And so that's the, just even in that mix, they often forget that their employer is uh, having to shell this money out. And then when you add the regulatory costs on top of that, yeah to comply with EPA and OSHA and other regulations, um, they have no clue of what it costs to employ them. The, no. there, there's a disconnect there. The entrepreneur knows, mm. but the employee doesn't know.